In our microscope lab, we saw these kinds of things. These are cells, living things, but they're really nothing more than containers. They contain stuff. We can actually call them vesicles. They contain stuff just like a baggie does. Here's a sandwich bag. It too is a container, just like a cell. The difference is a cell, which is living, can do three things. If I got this bag to do those three things, I'd call it a cell. I'd call it living. Cells are the basic units of life. All living things today are made of cells or are products of cells. Products of cells include hair, nails, tendons, xylem, and sugars. You better be thinking photosynthesis right now. Cells can seem pretty complicated, but the big picture, the big concept, is they just carry out those characteristics of life we mentioned earlier. Let's focus just on the cell membrane. The cell membrane is the outer barrier of a cell. It separates the cell from its environment. It gives the cell its shapes. It can be used in communication and it can help keep some things in and some things out. We call this semi-permeable. Here's a model showing semi-permeability. So I have red and white beads at the bottom of this box. In between is a barrier. If I turn this box over, let's see what happens. The white beads were allowed to go through, but the red beads were not. This barrier is semi-permeable. Only certain things can fit through. Here's a computer model showing us actual substances going in and out of the cell. Certain things can go right through the cell membrane. Oxygen, for example, goes right through, as does carbon dioxide. Glucose, however, needs a protein channel or a pore to go into the cell. Charged ions like potassium also need a special protein channel. Water, to some extent, can move through the membrane, but there is a special channel for it as well. This is the best. Watch what the membrane does with an enzyme. That's cool. Let's see it again. Amazing what the membrane can do. To show how a membrane can form, here's a high-tech demonstration. Hang on tight, it gets pretty exciting. What do you see forming here? That's right, vesicles. These are containers. And how do I get these to form? Soap. Soap molecules are composed of long chains of carbon atoms linked to other carbon atoms, also linked to hydrogen. These are known as hydrocarbons. To understand how a soap bubble is similar to cells, we must first review your favorite topic. Bonding. It's all about bonding. And who wants the electrons more? Remember the electronegativity? Let me put it to you this way. Let's say I've got a polar bear and a penguin who are fighting over ice cream. Who wants the ice cream more? It's hydrogen and chlorine. Chlorine wants the electrons more, so it's going to be more towards chlorine. It's a polar bond. Get it? Polar, it's a polar bear. As you recall then, water is a polar molecule. The oxygen atom wants the electrons more. So part of the water molecule is partially charged positive, the other is partially charged negative. And when I have water molecules together, they attract each other, positive to negative. So water molecules are also attracted to charges because they're charged. As we look at a soap molecule, it turns out one end is hydrophobic, does not like water. That's the yellow and black end you see here. The other end of the soap molecule is hydrophilic. That means it loves water. The part that is hydrophobic is nonpolar. It does not have any charge to it. The part that loves water is polar. There's a charge there. So hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydrophobic means nonpolar. Hydrophilic means polar. 
What would happen if I threw these soap molecules into water? Which of the molecules would want to be next to each other? Not this way. No, that's not going to work. Oh, there you go. The nonpolar ends associate with each other. The polar ends associate with the water. Just like the soap molecules, we have a cell membrane that is made of these molecules that have a polar end and a nonpolar end. So we're going to end up having the nonpolar ends associate with each other. We end up with two layers for our membrane. We call this a bilipid layer. Let's take a look at a micrograph. Here it is. You can see the two layers of our membrane right next to each other. Here's a model of a cell membrane. The green spheres you see here are the hydrophilic portions of this molecule. It's associated with the water on the outside of the cell. I have green spheres on the bottom too. They are associated with the water on the inside of the cell. The pink is the hydrophobic portions and they are associated on the inside getting away from water. Let's look at some of the stuff that made up our early Earth and therefore may have given rise to cells. These little chunks of black rock are a piece of extraterrestrial material. We actually think that a lot of these are from asteroids. You know, asteroids are those big chunks of rock between uh, Mars and Jupiter, and they're kind of left over from uh, the early solar system. They never got into a planet, so they're still floating around out there. When we analyze these little chunks of rock, what we discover is that they are unlike anything on the Earth. Okay, what we're going to do now is to put a couple of pieces of this into this mortar. Then we're going to add these solvents to it and grind it up. And uh, I'll just go ahead and put this in now. There we go, that should be enough. So don't grind it yet. The first thing I'm gonna do is to put in some of this stuff. It's a dilute acid. And what does the acid do? Well, the acid dissolves some of the material in the meteorite, and you can actually see it bubble a little, if you, a little bit if you look there. And so dissolving it and loosening up so that it makes it a little bit easier for us to use these other solvents to get stuff out. You can try grinding it now. Okay, I'm going to put in the next two things now. This is an alcohol called methanol, and this helps some of the organic material to come out of the meteorite and into solution. The last thing I'm putting in is a, a, a solvent called chloroform. They used to use that to put people to sleep, and you probably heard of chloroform. But what it does is to get the material in the meteorite that is kind of soapy. Now we found that there's uh, soap-like molecules in the meteorite. So we're going to get that out, dissolve it in the chloroform, and then take a look at it under the microscope. So I'm going to take a sample of that with this little pipette. I'm getting that bottom layer, the chloroform layer. I'm going to put that onto this microscope slide and let it dry. Now, the idea is that this is a simulation of the kind of thing that would occur on the early Earth four billion years ago. Meteorites and other extraterrestrial material was bringing organic molecules to the Earth, and these were then uh, being extracted from the meteorite by natural processes, uh, forming sort of oil slicks, very thin layers on the ocean surface. And wherever there was land, these things would come and dry out, just as you see here. So we're simulating the early Earth environment in this um, uh, laboratory uh, condition. What I'm going to do next is to add some water to that. This is a dilute solution of salt, similar to seawater, and we're going to put a drop of that on this cover slip. And in a sense, this would be the equivalent of rain falling on that dried out material on the early earth. It's going to rain on this cover slip. Okay, the water has now con contacted the uh, organic material from the meteorite, and we'll take a look at it under the microscope. 
All right, what we're seeing here is the medium reading material on the right is that kind of uh, uh, yellowish, bubbly looking material. And on the left is the water, that salt solution that we just added. And you can see that the water has already begun to penetrate into the sample. Here we are about five minutes later. The water has penetrated deeper into the sample. The sample itself has changed in its uh, texture. There's a lot more of that rounded material within the sample. And you can just begin to see the appearance of some uh, vesicular structures at this interface. Now those structures are more apparent here after 10 minutes. And uh, we focused on the structures. You can see these vesicular membranous structures right in the center of this image. And about half an hour later, what we see is that most of the material that was present in the meteorite has now formed these vesicular structures. What we proposed is that these are the kinds of self-assembly processes that led to the uh, earliest forms of cellular life. So simply using the molecules from a meteorite, these phospholipids, we can form not a cell, but the beginnings of a cell, a vesicle, a container, these form through chemical interactions and bring us one step closer to the formation of life on the Earth.